Coming up, he wanted nothing to do with God until he needed him to save his life. And a woman's own formula for success doesn't produce the results she envisioned. Well, welcome to 700 Club Canada. Bill, there was a fascinating news story about missionaries in Haiti that had been kidnapped. And it just has come out a few weeks ago that they escaped. Wow. From, you know, they and they were several weeks. Uh, people did not know how to reach them or get a hold of them. And they tell the story of their escape and how literally God blinded people's eyes, the hostage taker's eyes, and they literally walked out. Yeah, I, I, I remember reading, they were praying for the right moment and God yeah. actually they felt told them exactly yes. when to leave and how, what direction to head and yeah, all of that. I know. It really was fascinating. And if you've been to Haiti, you know how mountainous it is. Yes. So knowing which way to go is a big deal. A really big deal, especially but, if they, yeah, with that many people. Like there was right. how many of them? There was uh, about 20, 20 or something. Or something? Yeah. yeah, no, it was amazing. I think the question is, you know, how did they know that they could trust God? Like how did they know they could, it was him telling them, right? That's a really good question. And if they hadn't trusted that voice, yeah. I think the voice that we all have actually in us, yeah. the voice of God, they would have never escaped. They that would have never so found true. their freedom. So true. Well, today we're going to look at that question. Yes. How can I know if I can trust God? And and now, is Jesus really who people say he is? Can you trust him? This is how Michael discovered the truth. Watch this. And I remember walking past my dad's cell. His head was in his hands, and he was just praying. It was hard for Michael Lombardo to see his dad behind bars especially since it was Michael's fault he was there. And I remember feeling in my heart, like, you are horrible. The youngest of four, Michael grew up in a close-knit, blue-collar Christian home in New Jersey. For the most part, life was good, until Michael hit his teen years. I got involved with a group of friends, and we were all about drinking, partying, sleeping around. I enjoyed that lifestyle. I was in a punk rock band. We would travel around New Jersey a little bit and play shows. And I was like, I'm just going to dive into that lifestyle. I want nothing to do with this God stuff. Michael often disappeared for days at a time. His parents, Joe and Stephanie, worried. It was very hard. You know, a lot of tears, a lot of sleepless nights. I didn't know where he was. I didn't know. If he was okay or not, I just had to trust God. We had to trust God. I would sit him down and, you know, tell him, hey, what are you doing with yourself here? I know you're high, and, but in one ear and not the other. He wasn't our Michael anymore. Still, they loved and supported their son. His dad even gave him a job at his construction business after high school. But despite the warning signs, Michael wasn't about to stop. As I got a little bit older, 17, 18, 19, things, parties got crazier, the lifestyle got more reckless, and drugs were taking a toll on me physically. And I began to realize, like, hey, this isn't as, as cool and as great as I, as I thought it was. His parents prayed constantly. Stephanie says Psalm 91 brought her comfort. The guardian God for his people Israel. I'd just be, you know, weeping. And then you just have to kind of wipe those tears away and just start speaking the word of God. To start claiming his promises, you know, and, and, and agreeing with what God sees in Michael. One night, 18-year-old Michael had a car accident near his parents' home and was arrested for drug possession. His dad drove to the scene and tried to help. And they arrested him as well for obstructing justice. And I remember walking past my dad's cell. His head was in his hands, and he was just praying. And I remember feeling in my heart, like, you are horrible. And a lot of guilt, a lot of shame came in. Just kind of like gave it to God and said, Lord, you know, we don't know what to do with him anymore. He's yours. Joe and Michael were released that night and charges were dropped against Joe. Michael was given probation and a year of community service. But it wasn't until he wrecked another car a couple of years later that Michael started to realize the God he was running from was trying to get his attention. Both times I wasn't wearing a seatbelt, the cars were crushed. And I knew in my, in my heart and in my head that this was God. The fact that I'm not seriously injured, <laughs> you know, the fact that I didn't die, it was God. Michael knew it was time to change, but it wasn't that simple. 
I was getting suicidal thoughts, depression hit me, and I just, I tried everything to make myself happy in my own power and abilities. I tried more drugs, I tried more relationship, I plunged myself into my music. Every time I got what I wanted, I was still empty, broken, unhappy. And um, I came to that place of like, wow, I can't get myself out of this. Either I'm gonna die or I'm gonna reach out to Jesus and see if he is who people say he is. At 20, he decided it was time to stop running. Got in my room and I opened up that Bible that my sister gave me. And it was like the words were just leaping off the pages. And I knew it was God. My heart just broken, just calling out to Jesus. If you are who they say you are, I need you. And in that moment, it was like the whole atmosphere shifted in the room. Just his love poured into my heart. It was very, very tangible. The fear, the depression, the hopelessness just was just evaporated. I thought, this is better than drugs. And I remember hearing the voice of the Lord uh, for the first time very, very clearly. And he said to me, son, I have plans for your life. Michael couldn't wait to tell his parents he had given his life to Christ. He told me that he had this amazing encounter with God and, and uh, just weeping, You're just so happy. It's beautiful, you know, just beautiful. God answered all our prayers. Inside of me was jumping up inside out, you know, and I knew God was gonna use him. Michael says with God's strength, he was able to clean up every area of his life. Then in 2012, he graduated from Christ for the Nations Institute and began working overseas as a missionary. There, he met his wife, Selena. Today, they are still active in ministry and are raising a family together. I always thought God is about following rules and religious rituals and things, but no, it really is about a vibrant relationship with a loving Father through His Son, Jesus Christ. Don't give up on your loved ones because God sees every tear he sees you, he hears your prayers. With God, all things are possible. It doesn't matter how deep, how dark, uh, it doesn't matter what you've done in your life, he's there with open arms. Maybe like Joe and Stephanie, you have someone in your family that you love deeply and you just know they're headed in the wrong direction. They're in some self-destructive behavior and you're at an end, you don't know what to do. What, what do you do when you don't know what to do? Well, this is where trusting God comes into play. Stephanie said it really well. She said, I would just start speaking the word of God. She would start claiming the promises of God and agreeing that God saw something in Michael that maybe she couldn't. And so maybe you've heard this, you know, you've heard people say, yeah, I'm just speaking the word of God over the situation. And, and why would you do that? And what does it actually do? It's a really good question. Well, here's what I've learned. When I speak the truth of who God is and the promises of God found in his word, first of all, it changes the way I think about my situation. In Romans 12, verse two, it says, don't conform to the pattern of this world, right? This world's gonna tell you it's awful, there's no good that's gonna come of this. But he says, instead, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, when you claim the promises of God, it helps you believe the best instead of the worst, the opposite of news, right? Second, it aligns your heart with God's love. In 1 John 4, it says, Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. I can't help but think of the story of the prodigal son. In that story, the father allowed his son to go while keeping the door open. See, here's the truth. You don't have to carry the shame and consequences of another person's decisions, but you must always be waiting to love them back into the kingdom. The third thing it does is it brings hope in the middle of despair. Hebrews 13, eight says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so when you read the stories of what Jesus has done, what God can do, he gives hope for your situation. And so if you're here and you're struggling with something right now, there's a loved one that you care about, I wanna encourage you, don't give up. Just like Stephanie said, don't give up. God is doing something. Claim the promises of God over that loved one. And if you call us today at 1-855-759-0700, we want to pray with you, but also put this resource in your hand entitled Backsliding, giving you some helpful tips on how to figure out how to find your way back. Well, up next, Tessa falls for a love she never saw coming. What is an estate plan and do I need it? An estate plan ensures your stuff will be distributed in the best, most tax-efficient way. We plan so many other things. Why don't we plan our wills? 
Creating a plan for your will ensures that you have taken into account any tax implications, discussed options for the best way to pass on your stuff, thought about who would be the best executor, and considered your specific situation. 700 Club Canada has partnered with Advisors with Purpose to help you create a personal estate plan. Their services are free, confidential, and no one will sell you anything. Contact Advisors with Purpose today at plan at advisorswithpurpose.ca. I was born in Iran. And I was a very thoughtful, serious child, and I grew up believing that all faiths were more or less the same. It was a man-made thing. It answered our needs. And I just wasn't one of those people who needed it. I adored my dad. I felt my dad really felt the same about me. But at the same time, my dad was a very busy man. He wasn't home very often. I knew he loved me. There was never a doubt in my mind. But I wasn't quite sure that I was enough. And so I learned to strive to be lovable. By the time I was a teenager, there was a profound sense of loneliness that has settled in my heart. Because of my parents' divorce, my mom, my sister, and I went to England. My father remained in Iran. Our communication was very limited. With the revolution and everything, it almost became impossible. I couldn't go back. And so the world came between us, but my heart didn't fully understand that, didn't grasp that. What I grasped was, my daddy is not here. If my daddy wanted to be here, he would make a way. So I lost my family. I lost my home. I lost my language. I made this vow that I myself would never divorce because I saw the price of it in my heart. I started attending a boarding school for young ladies. We had to attend church. They told those of us who were from a different faith background that we could sit on the balcony and we could read our own faith books. And I used to sneak romance novels under my uniform, the Harlequin romance level, but also more literary kind, like the Jane Austen and the Charlotte Brontes that ultimate story about a person who's rejected from childhood for no fault of her own, and someone admired by everybody else, someone recognized as mighty and good, finally looks at her and sees her worth. That was the story my heart was hungry for. It was all responding to this need, to this core need for someone to see me exactly as I was and still love me and absolutely and utterly find me worthy, worthy of pursuit, worthy of love. I met a young man and we fell in love. Some 21 year olds are quite mature. That wasn't us. Within a few years, you could see the cracks in our maturity reflected in our marriage. When that marriage essentially ended, I came into a very dark place. My formula for life proved faulty. If I was good enough, if I was smart enough, if I worked hard enough, if I was enough, that then I could be happy. And that hadn't worked. I had a dream about Jesus one night. And what's really amazing about that dream is the only time I went to church really was those years when I was in boarding school. I never heard the gospel. I never read the Bible. But this is the thing. I knew he was the son of God. I knew it absolutely. And when he came closer, I looked into his eyes. And in those eyes, I saw something I will never see in this world. The measure of love that put him on the cross and the depth of power that made the stars. They shone through those eyes and I almost fell on my knees. 
because I, I couldn't stand anymore. And he just went like this to me, and I knew what he meant was, follow me. And he wasn't just saying, follow me a few steps. He was saying, follow me. And I, I would have done anything. I woke up from the dream, not a Christian. I still didn't really know what the gospel was. Jesus himself hadn't told me the gospel. But I woke up with an unshakable peace. Very quickly after that, the Lord surrounded me with Christians. They all invited me to church. They invited me to Bible study. And for the first time in my life, I began to hear the gospel, read the Bible. And I thought, what's all this? Give me a list of do's and don'ts that will fix my life. That's what I was looking for. So I didn't fully understand, but the people around me, I understood. They were different. There was an old priest, and he came to me, and he said, when are you going to come to Christ, Tessa? All the thoughts in my head were some kind of answer to just swat away that question. So I opened my mouth to do that very thing. And do you know what came out of my mouth? What came out of my mouth was, I already do. And as the words came out of my mouth, I realized, I do believe. He asked me to follow him himself, and I do, with all my heart. God, he is someone greater than other men. He is the king of kings. He pursues us. He was the one who saw me, this faulty, average, fallen young girl, and he set his affections on me. My worth isn't in what I do. My worth is that Jesus calls me his beloved. You know, the gospel is so beautiful, but sometimes we have a hard time explaining it. Well, I wanna share with you a simple drawing that I often use with people so I can share the story of the gospel in a simple way. And also maybe this will help you understand it better for yourself. It involves three circles. You know, the first circle tells us that we were made by a loving God and we were in a loving relationship with God. But it does tell us in the Bible, and it uses a word called sin, that when humans chose to go against what God asked of them, it broke that relationship with God. And sin then put us into a world that is broken. And we live in a broken world, and we all experience that in all kinds of ways, but we're looking for a way out of brokenness. And some of us, well, we try harder. We become more spiritual or more religious. We do more things. The more things, the, the gooder I can become, then God will accept me. Or maybe we try to escape through drugs or alcohol or, or sex, all these things, but we're told this, and we know this is true. None of those escape us out of brokenness. In fact, they boomerang us right back into brokenness. So what is the way out of brokenness? Well, the good news is God provided a way out of brokenness and a solution to sin. And God's solution to sin came in the form of his son, Jesus. See, this is why Jesus came to earth, died on a cross, to pay the price for sin for you and for me. He rose again from the day and he conquered death and he became alive again. And the simple gospel is this. If you want a way out of brokenness, the Bible says, just turn, look at Jesus, repent, meaning turn away from your sin and brokenness and believe in Jesus and what he did for you on the cross. Say thank you and welcome Jesus to be Lord and leader of your life. And when you do that, you are brought back into right relationship with God. That is the gospel. For God so loved the world that he sent his son and whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Share the story of the gospel with someone today and believe it for yourself. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples, for great is his love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever.
So the question we have today is, how do I know if I can trust God? It's a really good question, but we have to establish what we mean by trust. So by definition, that word trust means to have a firm belief in the reliability, truth, or ability of someone or something. So I know a lot of people I, I talk to say, well, God hasn't ever done anything for me. Well, first of all, that is so far from the truth. I mean, just take a deep breath. What did you do to earn that or deserve it? Nothing. God gave you life. But I know what they mean. They mean God didn't do it the way I wanted. I trusted him with something and he didn't come through. Well, the truth is that's not the best either because here, think about it this way. Imagine if a dentist did what you wanted. You would never get any fillings and you'd have cavities. Or imagine if a parent always did what the child wanted. You'd have spoiled kids. Or imagine if the police said to criminals, oh yeah, you're right, you just do whatever you want and let them go free. The irony is, is you'd say they'd actually violated the trust that was given to them. So God, yes, he doesn't always do it our way. He does it the best way. So maybe it's based on a feeling though. A lot of people say, well, I don't feel God. Where is God? And here's what I've learned about life. My feelings can be really unreliable. I have felt a lot of things that were wrong. So what does it mean then to trust God? Well, this is where Paul in Philippians chapter three answers the question. He says, here's what it means. He says, I wanna know Christ. That word know doesn't mean just mentally. It means actually in experience, um, a depth of understanding in practice. I wanna know the power of his resurrection and I wanna participate with him in his suffering, becoming like him in his death. That word becoming like him um, is, is the word uh, from the word where we get the morph suit. I don't know if you know what a morph suit is. Maybe you've seen it at a hockey game or something. There's green and blue, all these colors. These people put a morph suit on and it takes on the shape of whoever's wearing it. So how do you know if a morph suit is doing its job? Well, it looks, it takes the shape of the one who's wearing it. What, what Paul is saying is to trust God is to actually know him, to know his character, to know that he has proven himself, not only through scripture, but in our own experience. We have thousands of years of God's proven character and nature. And so Paul says, in response to that, how do I learn to trust God? Well, I begin to participate with him in what he does. I begin to look like him. So how can you really know him? Well, it begins by trusting who he is, what he said, and how he wants to work in your life. Maybe not the way you think he should, maybe not with your feelings, but in the very best way. And when you do that, when you really know him, you I promise you, you will learn to trust him. And that is a stepping stone to being who God has created you to be. Hi, I'm Miravik, and on behalf of Union Gospel Mission, I would like to personally thank you for partnering with 700 Club Canada. Because of our work together, we are able to reach thousands of men, women, families, and seniors who are struggling with homelessness, poverty, and addiction with the gospel. We're able to provide hot and nourishing meals daily, as well as Christmas hampers for families and individuals who otherwise would go without this Christmas season. Thank you so much for your partnership and God bless. One of my favorite things about 700 Club Canada's ministry is how we strategically partner with ministries across our nation, Union Gospel Mission being one of them. And that is how we can reach more people with not only the word of the gospel, but the action and the benefit of the gospel. So why don't you join us today for as little as $20 a month and we make it easy. Sign up for Pledge Express, automatic deposit. Each month will come out of your bank account and it will help us save on administrative fees. And meaning actually that your money will go farther into those in need. So give us a call today and you'll receive the nearness of heaven as our thank you gift. Just call 1-855-759-0700. And what does Jesus mean that the kingdom of heaven is within you or within your midst? The kingdom of God is at hand. That means you can literally reach up and grab it. His presence is right there with you. If you're saved, if you're a Christian, 
Jesus is dwelling in your heart. I think the Lord was preparing me, like you're about to enter a battle, but I am with you. He is the God that can make the impossible possible. In this life, please love God. Seek him first. He always knew where I was, and he was there with open arms. No matter what we go through, God is there to help us through. All these things will be added unto you. Jesus loves you. You can't even imagine what God has for you. The Nearness of Heaven, available now. Well, Bill, I really appreciated your devotional saying, how can I trust God? Like, it's true. We, we don't trust because we actually want God to do things our way. Right? Well, and what I have learned, being married for as long as I've been married, yeah. is that it's Carlene's character. I know who she yeah, is. That's so even when she does things, or I'm sure I do a lot of things <laughs> that are like, what was that about? I know who she is, and I yes. am able to interpret it the right way. And it's yeah. the same with God. When you know who he is, yeah. You can trust, no matter what you're going through, that he's got your yes. back. He's working it for good, even if it doesn't feel like it yes. or doesn't look like it. That is so, so true. And I think all our testimonies speak to that yeah, on absolutely. some level, don't they? And I trust today you have been more encouraged to trust God. And thank you for giving us your encouragement. Carol said, I want to say thank you for your wonderful show. I watch it every day. I am a real fan of the testimonies. There it is, those testimonies. It's the win the all story. over, Carol. It's so it's good. True. And Ellen said, I thank God for the 700 Club Canada's TV program and their ministry. Mm. Thank you, Ellen. Mm. Yeah, it's so true, though, isn't it? Story, too. Yeah. Uh, that's another way you learn to trust God, through yeah. your story. That's true. And, and when I look at my story, and I know you'd say the same, yeah. God has shown himself to be faithful yes. time and time and yes. time again, even though in the middle of it, I didn't understand. I didn't. Yeah. I was scared. I was afraid. All those things we feel. Yeah but he always proves that he's gonna work it for the best. Yes, you know, the other night I was picking up some Greek food and I was standing in line, this woman was really distraught. So I just asked her if I could pray for her. And after I prayed for her, I said, do you know how much God loves you and what the Bible says to you? And she didn't know, so my three circles. I love that. I literally just pulled out, I had on my phone and I simply shared the gospel with her. And she said to me, no one's ever explained it to me before. And I just wanna say, if you have someone in your life that needs to know they can trust God, that he's good, that he loves them, that's the gospel. And if those three little circles help you share that, please use that. Yeah, and tell them what God is really like. Yes. Not what other people say he's that's like. That's so good. Well, Colossians 3.12 says, therefore as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. There it is, that morph suit, put it on. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching, have an amazing day. To contact us, visit 700club.ca. On the next 700 Club Canada, a mother searches for meaning after her newborn son's diagnosis and a cartoon changes an entire family's life.